what I want to, to give you uh, uh, a warm welcome to our session, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the multi uh, multidisciplinary reconstruction of payer flood. And uh, this session, as you know, uh, is devoted uh, to integrate uh, data from different archives into a uh, paleo flood uh, chronology, let's say it like this. Some are proxies, uh, others are direct flood data, so historical data, and so on. Um, we have in total, uh, as you know, two blocks. This is the morning blocks, this is the uh, afternoon blocks uh, with eight, eight uh, talks uh, uh, each. And then in the afternoon uh, at uh, 5 p.m., we have the hopefully very interesting poster, uh, poster sessions. Uh, we'll, we'll be free, I think, uh, uh, to share this. And uh, what I want to only to, 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 to give two or three words about our session is um, that we are very happy uh, uh, together with my colleagues, uh, with co-chair this session, Daniel Schilworth, Gerardo Benito, uh, Bruno Wilhelm, uh, Juan Carlos Peña, Juan Ignacio Sanzistevan, uh, Carlos Balas, uh, Blas Valero Gaffes, uh, uh, Markus Stoffel. I'd be happy to get uh, so a uh, nice response from you. It's an interesting uh, works here. And uh, probably one of the, the outstanding thing is here, uh, it's only the first block, but you see it because of the different colors here. Uh, we try to, to make a mix up of uh, everything a little bit. And the interesting thing is we have different archives. There are lakes, we have uh, floodplain uh, archives, we have uh, uh, marine and lake deposits, we have historical deposits, we have uh, uh, gloves, uh, we have deposits from, from, from fjords and so on. And also this, this very uh, uh, this, uh, heterogeneous uh, picture, we also have put on the time slice, this is our presentation about 200 years up to the LGM. And also with the regions, we are in the Mediterranean, we are the mid-altitudes, we are in the southern hemisphere, Australia, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and so hopefully uh, we have a broad overview uh, uh, on the regional scale, on the archive scale, and so on. I have to warn you, this is the second tech talk after this technical talk yesterday about uh, the uh, linked data earth project. And you will see that there are a lot of similarities between. Um, the idea of creating a database for all flood um, archives um, is uh, about one year old. It was born in Grenoble and then we started to think how to do this technically. The goal from the floods uh, working group page you can read is to have an open access archive that is visible for all and that you can intercompare the different archive types. So it's necessary to have a common data structure across all these multiple proxy types you have seen on the first slide, the introduction. Um, then very early there was the wish that we should use the sensor archive observation concept from Evans. And so this is another thing that we have to consider. We have this, this lot of uh, archive types um, that you see here and that we will hear hear a lot of it in the uh, uh, today and all of them have very special uh, things. Bruno Wilhelm asked for um, contributions who would like to contribute to this database and a lot of candidates come in. Thank you for all this feedback and you see that it's all across the world, um, that it's all kinds of types of archives, a lot of time ranges are there and that we even have um, yeah, some information about the magnitude in, in some archives. So it was very clear that we have a, a minimal data structure that is necessary to search for the data. Um, that is the um, most common thing across all these archives. It has five main clusters. That uh, is about where come the source from, uh, where is it located about the time, then the classification, if there is a flood or how, how large the flood was, and uh, references to, uh, for example, to publication. So if you have 
deeper look into the proxy types, they differ a lot by the time range they cover, uh, by the resolution they have in time. Also the location is very different, also the types of, of location, if you have a forest or caves or cities maybe. And they also, this can be distinguished by the sensibility, how they react to a flood by extension or, or duration of the flood. You can also have sometimes negative signals that tell you about that there was no flood because it was very drought. You have of course different levels of noise and sometimes you have additional information about the causes or the impacts or about temperature or precipitation and so on. Yeah, here's again this, this table where I try to summarize a little bit the differences of the archives. It's just some house numbers and not very exactly maybe, but gives you an idea that they are really different and maybe also give you an idea what you can do with a combination of, of all those. So if we have a look into the sensor archive observation model, you can see that we have the environment that a uh, sensor is looking for, sensor writes into the archive and then the scientists do the observation and come to some conclusion about the environment some time ago. For example, if we have the flood, uh, the tree looks for the flood somehow, writes its information into the wood, then you look maybe for the ring density and then you can estimate how large the flood was. But there's, for example, also the temperature or the precipitation going inside, so this is um, yeah, maybe just uh, a guess or whatever, or just an, yeah, a, a near approximation. So if you combine these things, then you get maybe better results because you have different uh, environmental conditions that rise into different, or that are looked by different sensors, for example, also by the cave that rides into the stalagmites, or a person that rides the chronicle. Then you can look for this by different methods, and then you can have a combined um, value for the flood magnitude, and maybe also for other things. Yeah, you see this is a great advantage of combining different things. But of course, if you want to do this, you need uh, more data. Yeah. Um, but more data also means that you document the whole process better. So from a scientific approach, this is also very good. Then we get some example data by members of the floods working group. Um, then we get a lot more data fields that are necessary. Uh, this is the, the inner circle with the must things that, that uh, you need to provide. And then there's a lot of additional things that you can provide or yeah, depending on the archive types, you can also keep it empty. If we look for a file format, how to collect these things, then there should be some uh, preconditions. For example, it should be human readable so that you can easily create it and edit it. But also, of course, it should be machine readable so that you can import and export it to uh, other software or the to tools. You should check this for completeness and consistency, and also changes should be traceable. So uh, maybe it's better to avoid a binary format because then, of course, you cannot read it by human. <laughs> yeah, then we have this problem. You might know this uh, comic. Um, you have, it says 14 standards, and we need to combine them so that we have one common, and you end with the situation that you have 15 competition competing standards. Um, this could also be true for scientific data. And if we invent, for example, a, a CSV format that you can edit in Excel files, then uh, we have an additional format. That's quite compact for the mandatory fields. But if you add, add the uh, optional data, then it really gets a mess. You get a really large Excel. Uh, sheet and maybe not so nice. And you have a new format that you have to consider. So maybe there's a better approach. And uh, then we come back to this linked data format. 
uh, that is a mixture of JSON and CSV files. And this has also the advantage that it was made for proxy data, so it covers already the sediments, spillio themes, tree rings, all these things quite well. There are tools available where you can convert, for example, Excel files uh, to, to this format, or you can edit it online, or you can do some uh, analyzing. And it's quite good structure. It also has this, this structure uh, that is given by the main clusters, but it needs some enhancements for historical documents especially. And it would be good if we could have some standardizing in the uh, columns that we have for flood data, for example. So we have this main two different things that we have this classical proxy archive that is mostly annually and periodically and we have historical documents that are diff different by nature. For example, often only extreme events are considered and recorded and not the time in between. Also, persons can travel, they can travel around and uh, while trees or caves or whatever are usually fixed. So two possibilities to extend uh, this document format. So we need data for the sources and for the locations that can differ uh, individually. And so the first idea is to add this into the data set here. Um, have two additional tables for the source data and the quotes, for example, or have individual location data for each um, measurement of a flood. Uh, second idea is that you use uh, this proxy measurement and add the tables there, and you don't need to touch the central data set. Um, nearly the same. Yeah, nice would be if we have a uh, completely JSON uh, method with no CSV files. It would be better to search inside of these tables and to uh, have this uh, online. Yeah, then we have finally the problem that we have now the data, but we need a platform where we can upload the data, we can search for the data, we can add data there, or we can search for time frames, for magnitudes, for special locations that we are interested in. Um, it would be good if we can download the files and analyze them further, or if we have an access via an IPE that we can directly access it, for example, in R. And of course, it should be long-term available so that it will not die after some, some time. First idea was to use Tambora, uh, where I'm working on, but it is made for historical documents only. It has a database and the web access running, and it's uh, operated by the library, so it will be uh, running long term, but it needs enhancements for the sediments or spillio themes. So maybe we can add this here, have probes and samples here and can then add data for tree rings, for example. Um, but maybe there are other ideas that other organizations or other institutions can host the flood database, or other um, pages projects are doing the same. They have maybe the same issue. They have different proxies as well. And then the linked earth data maybe would be very promising because they also are based on the linked paleo data. Thing. So the next steps would then be to enhance the uh, data format to, to uh, oh sorry, to have these individual locations, to add some data for the sources and the quotes, and to standardize the columns, names, and units that are used for the flood data. Yeah, we need to agree where to run this um, and who can join the work and. Yeah, how it how it will stay alive for the next years. So this is the vision that, that will finally end my talk. You have finally then all the flood data in one area. You can search for it, for example, by year or by country or by area. 
and then you get a list of all the documents and all the floods that are available in the database. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, how to organize all this multi-proxy data. Are there questions? I have time for questions. Any question? Well, I, I have a question. Michel, uh, what do you, uh, could, what is your opinion from your experience uh, regarding with two problems, which is the, um, uh, we are talking about proxies uh, from, let's say, national archives, and not all the, all the proxies are annual, have an annual resolution, has tree rings or wharf lakes. Uh, we have also to deal with other types, uh, which have not that resolution. How do we, how do you think, how to, could you integrate this data into database? And the second question is, could you recommend something uh, with regard to the original scale, which this type of approach could work uh, best? Um, the first thing is that I, I would recommend to refine the, the time structure to have a the possibility to have finer uh, time ranges, for example, that you have time ranges of a month or even on day basis, um, so that you have a timestamp that says it was this day where the flood was, was the highest. That would also make sense for tree rings, for example, because they are also often very sensible to, to seasons, so that you only have, for example, sensibility for floods in the in the summer season, and then you can also have a um, better or more exact time thing. I think this is possible if you, if you just uh, don't count the years only, but say you add some, some further information there. Uh, second question I don't get exactly. It's the No, I have. No, I have not. No, I, I haven't done anything about integrating data or analyzing data further. Um, so maybe other talks will, will cover this. I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, this, I'm, I'm only technical, and technical is the whole world, of course. So. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the very long title. So I'm here on behalf of my uh, friend and colleague, P P Pierre Sabatier. He was not able to join us today. So I will tell you about uh, floods in the Alps. Um, basically, this is a way to create uh, the data set that will be included in the, in the database we have seen just before. So why are we doing that? It's, it's pretty clear, I mean, I mean, for all of you, that uh, uh, the projections on the, on the, by the models are pretty uncertain regarding the uh, occurrence of uh, of uh, uh, extreme precipitation events in a, in a projected uh, warming uh, climate. So the, the two um, model output you can see there and there show that this small thing here, these are the Alps. And you can see that if you are in the Alps, depending on the model, you don't know if it's uh, blue, it means more uh, extreme precipitation, or if it's red, it's less uh, extreme precipitation. So we don't know, thanks to the model. So our approach is to extend the time series over a past warm and a cold period, trying to, to know if uh, this type of period is uh, favoring or not favoring the occurrence of uh, extreme precipitation. So what we do in the French Alps here, you have a, a, an overview of a data set we are trying to build up for now several years. And so our approach is to go in high altitude lake with small catchment area and to find a way to reconstruct both the, uh, the, uh, the frequency and the intensity of, uh, of flood throughout the time. So you can see that here it's presented the last uh, uh, 2,000 uh, years. And what I will present you today is the, I would say the latest release of this uh, on, uh, on, pro, on under construction data set that is uh, made in a, in a lake in, uh, at the border in, in between France and Italy. So the method is uh, rather simple. 
So if you have a mountain and you have a lake, when it rains, you have sediment that comes from the mountain that goes down to the lake. It's pretty simple. And then you get this type of uh, specific layer. And we, are, we have developed a method uh, that is a, a more or less unified protocol to, uh, to uh, detect this type of event. And uh, then we can reconstruct both the frequency, which is the easiest, and you say, okay, this is a, a flood layer, and this, does, this has this <coughs> age. So at this age, we have this flood layer. And also, we are trying to uh, assess the intensity of the, of, the, of the flood that generated this layer. And this is done by sickness or done by the uh, grain size information. And so we can say that lake sedimentas are an archive of past extreme precipitation. So the case I will present you today is uh, like uh, Savine. As you can see, it's uh, at the border in between uh, France and uh, Italy. This is a pretty large lake for uh, an high altitude lake. And uh, of course, the reason why it's not that fast to build up this, uh, this data set is that it's geology, so we have to work slowly and carefully. And in that case, we have a, a, a particular uh, case. It was the occurrence of this uh, type of um, deposit. And we found that these are what we call homogenite, and it's called due to the shaking of the lake due, by, uh, due uh, to earthquakes. So these are the, what we call here T2. And uh, T1 are turbidites that are uh, related to uh, floods. Um, in our protocol, we uh, check uh, the, the fact that it's really a flood using this type of graph. Here is the, the grain size, and this is the sickness. And you can see that we have two different processes because we have two different relationships in between sickness and grain size. And here we verify that we have a constant relationship in between uh, grain size and, and the sickness, which means that we don't have a specific perturbation of the, of the catchment in particular uh, due to uh, potential uh, disturbance by human activities. So this is how we try to construct a chronology. And in that case, we have another very specific feature, which was that part of the core, which we found to be a, a, a complete reversal of the sequence. We have one sequence, and we have a flipped sequence, which that is exactly the same above. So it's not very important for floods, but it's important to know that this is not uh, uh, here. You don't have the time that is evolving. So you have this straight line here. So you have to remove it to construct the um, edge depth model. Of course, we use uh, lead to 10 cesium to uh, date the uppermost part of the core. And this is very interesting in that case, because we were able to find that those layers were uh, due to uh, the occurrence of floods that, that were historically known. So it was possible to uh, perform a weather reanalysis uh, on those specific dates. And we found that the, the floods that were recorded in the lake uh, were, were, can be uh, sorted in two uh, different groups due to uh, weather reanalysis. And uh, um, most of them, they are dominated by what we call East Return. So this is a, a specific weather situation in which you have uh, the humidity that is coming back from um, the Mediterranean to the uh, recording point that is here. And we have 75% um, of the floods that are uh, generated by this type of weather. And 25% uh, um, of the floods that were generated by more uh, classical uh, westerly input. So of course, when you have this, such a geological record, you don't record only floods. You, re you are recording a lot of things. And I told you about those uh, earthquake shaking uh, uh, that make a specific layer. And we have five of them, yeah, uh, five cluster of uh, seismicity that were recorded in that lake. Um, the oldest one was also uh, recorded in other uh, different lakes in, in the Alps. So we are pretty confident that this is really due to earthquake shaking. Here you have the evolution of the sedimentation rate, and we show that uh, we have a strong in influence of human activity on sedimentation rate. Uh, at that period, this is uh, the end of the Iron Age and the antiquity, and this is exactly the same date as we found in another lake 
much uh, northern uh, in the Alps. But we found that this had no impact on, on the uh, recording of floods in that specific case. So we are pretty confident uh, about this uh, reconstruction, that is uh, our flood frequency reconstruction, and it's really related to, to, uh, to, to floods. And you can see that we have an interesting match with this reconstruction that is a synthesis by uh, uh, Stephanie Wirth uh, from uh, southern, uh, it's a transect of five lakes in the uh, southern Alps. And you can see that the wiggle are matching uh, relatively well. And we have this uh, shift uh, around uh, 4,000 uh, uh, Kelvin pin that shows that we have a, a, a different uh, a pattern in a flood frequency uh, over the last uh, 4,000 4, years. Um, so at the million year scale, we have a strong relationship with, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, southern Alps reconstruction. And at higher frequency, we found that those small wiggles are uh, maybe related to uh, changes in, a, in a solar insulation. So to conclude, we have here a nice record of earthquake <coughs> in, northern, uh, in Northern Alps. We also have a strong human activity uh, that uh, changed uh, the relationship uh, to, uh, um, to uh, sedimentation rate and erosion. But uh, we have a nice uh, record of floods that is validated. And uh, we are recording, in particular, this increase in flood frequency around uh, 4,000 KBP. And uh, at this more uh, highest resolution, here we have a relationship with uh, uh, solar minima. That is maybe uh, new, new information on the uh, pacing of those high resolution changes. So this is it. Thanks for attention. Uh, can you give an example? How do you uh, match uh, solar minima with your flat frequencies? How, how do you do it? How do we match? Concerning, concerning the chronological resolution, for example. This is, this is just a, a simple comparison like this. So do we, we didn't uh, apply yet uh, uh, specific uh, statistics. Okay, thank you. Could you just elaborate on the, the difference in the sort of climatic systems from the Northern Alps to the Southern Alps? Would you expect them to be similar or do you expect them to be different? Mm. Uh, over the last 1,500 years, we have shown that we have uh, uh, differences in between Northern Alps and the Southern Alps, I mean, on the, on the French part. So the Alps, North, South, and also East, West is different. Huh? But on the French side, which is the Western side, uh, in between the north and the south, what we found is difference. Uh, the frequency is pretty similar, but the intensity is different, which is, let's say during the Little Ice Age, for instance, in northern Alps, you have more frequent uh, uh, floods, but they are less intense. But in southern Alps, you have more frequent uh, floods, and they are also more intense. So it's, it's, it's a bit different. So this is what, how we catch the differences nowadays, but we don't have enough uh, records to be pretty sure about that, so we need to reproduce that. And as you have seen, each case is a single case. You have, you have to geologically uh, read it and understand it, and uh, so it takes time. So I'm pretty confident that we are building now a nice data set, and within some years we can say more, hope so. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start with my talk, which is entitled On the Frequency, Seasonality, and Atmospheric Drivers of Late Holocene Heavy Rainfall in Western Mediterranean. It is focused on a very nice and far sequence from Lake Mont Cortés. It is located in the Spanish Pyrenees. It's actually quite close to, to where we are now. Well, we all know that floods and storms are among the most devastating natural disasters in terms of casualties and economic losses. As an example, we can see here the effects of a catastrophic flood that occurred in the Eastern Pyrenees, very close to our study site just four years ago. And these flash floods are very common in sensitive areas such as Western Mediterranean. We use natural archives to understand the long-term variability of these extreme events beyond the instrumental period, which barely spans the last 100, 150 years in the best scenarios. And we all know that lakes are very sensitive to these extreme hydrological events. And in particular, VARP sequences in lake records are extremely valuable because 
we can carry out paleoflat reconstructions with annual to even seasonal resolution. But these Holocene bar sequences are very scarce at a global scale, and in particular in Western Mediterranean, and there is another limitation because the human impact uh, during the 20th century, during the last decades, have modified in most of the sites the sediment dynamics. So it's really difficult in us to, to establish a proxy calibration with instrumental climatic data from nearby meteorological stations. So that's why we consider Lake Mont Cortez, that is a very good site, an exceptional site for paleohydrological studies, because it's a unique barf record in Western Mediterranean. We have an absolute continuous barf chronology for the last 2,800 years. We also have flat layers that are punctuating the sedimentary record. And we also have a reduced human impact during the 20th century. So we can establish this comparison with instrumental precipitation data sets. On top of that, this lake is located in a transitional area with a strong precipitation gradient, as we can see in this climatic map from the Iberian Peninsula. And it's very sensitive to changes in atmospheric circulation modes coming from either the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Well, in the area, the main precipitation is around 800 millimeters. There is two rainy seasons in the spring and autumn, although the extreme events, the heavy rainfalls, occur mostly during the cold season, in particular in, in autumn. <clears throat> uh, here in this, in this geological sketch, we can see uh, that the lake is emplaced on Triassic formations. It's mostly carbonates and gypsiferous materials. It's a karstic lake uh, with steep margins and a maximum water depth of 30 meters. The hydrology is mainly controlled by, by groundwater inputs and evaporation outputs, although there is a, a small stream in the northern shore that is controlling the maximum lake level. And it's an oligotrophic and meromictic lake with anoxia in the lake bottom that allows the preservation of these biogenic varves. So in order to study these biogenic varves, we got sediment cores in the distal part of the lake, and we built a complete um, composite sedimentary sequence that you can see here. It's more than five meters long. And we got thin sections in the whole uh, profile in order to, to study these mic microphases. So the biogenic varves of Lake Mont Cortez are composed of calcite layers that precipitate during the warm season in relation to algal blooms, we have organic layers that uh, are being deposited during the cold season. And then we have the detrital layers related to storms in the area. And this study focus on these detrital layers, these clastic macrophases. And depending on the position of these storm events within the VAR sequence, we can reconstruct seasonality. That means that if we have the detrital layer within the the calcite layer is going to be a summer storm. If it's just above the calcite layer, it's going to be a, a rainfall that occurs in autumn. In the middle of the organic layer would be a winter storm, and the same applies to the spring storms just below the calcite layer. So we've reconstructed seasonality following this pattern for more than 400 years. We see that most of the rainfalls occur during the cold season. And this is also in agreement. It follows the same pattern that precipitation during the instrumental period. So it, it, it somehow corroborates our hypothesis of seasonality. Um, concerning the clastic microphases, we have identified three different types of clastic micro microphases in the, in the sedimentary record. We have non-continuous detrital layers that are composed of small patches with reduced thickness and grain size. We also have continuous detrital layers thicker, higher grain size, and they are deposited in the lake via interflows. And then we have also turbidite type layers. Mm -hmm. They are much thicker. They have a, a coarse basal sublayer here and a fine enough wire texture, as we can see in this zirconium profile. And they represent the large amounts of sediment, delivered to the, of sediment that is delivered to the lake via uh, hyperpignal currents, via underflows. Well, so uh, once we, we understand the VARF dynamics and we've characterized the microphases, we can compare our record with instrumental climatic data. And for that, we've chosen this 
meteorological station that is 15 kilometers north of the lake. It has a daily precipitation since 1917 in a continuous manner, so it's one of the best in the Pyrenees. And here we have the annual daily maximum precipitation. And if we compare it with our, the tri with our microfacies, the trital microfacies, we see that there is a, a good relation between it, between them. And also, we have the two largest historical floods from the Segre River, that is 30 kilometers east from the lake, that are also recorded as a detrital layer and as a turbidite. So this, this lake is really recording extreme events. Well, if we look in detail at this, we, we've got 11 detrital phases during the last 80 years. We've recorded the 70% of the events higher than 100 millimeters. And we've also got a minimum precipitation threshold for the generation of these detrital layers. That is 80 millimeters for the non-continuous detrital layers and 90 millimeters for uh, the detrital layers and the flat turbidites. Uh, that correspond to two years return period, uh, no, four years return period for the detrital layers and the turbidites. Well, uh, we have to take into consideration, of course, that these thresholds may have varied in the past because of land use changes that will affect or may have affected the sensitiveness of the lake to, to record these flood events. So we have to take this always into consideration. Well, if we look at this map, we see that the sea level pressure anomalies during these heavy rainfall events correspond to negative anomalies over the Iberian Peninsula during dominant meridional circulation modes. We, we, are, we know that the, the atmospheric circulation patterns that are controlling precipitation in the Iberian Peninsula are the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Western Mediterranean Oscillation, and the Mediterranean Oscillation. And in particular, this one is characterized by an um, pressure dipole between the east and the west across the Mediterranean, and it's also controlling most of the precipitation in the, in the Mediterranean areas. So we, we saw that during these heavy rainfall events, they occur under very negative phases of, of the Mediterranean Oscillation. And also we see a relation between um, the frequency of these negative Mediterranean oscillation phases and the average cold season Mediterranean oscillation. So it's, it, this, this atmospheric teleconnection pattern has a better predictive capacity and also uh, is indicative of the, these heavy rainfalls in Lake Mogortes are indicative of the prevailing atmospheric circulation that is controlling this seasonal Mediterranean oscillation uh, in the Western Mediterranean. Well, once we've calibrated the record, we know the var sediment dynamics, we know the detroit and microphases, and we understand the climatic teleconnection patterns, uh, we can start with the storminess reconstruction during the late Holocene. And this is what you can see here. So this is the last 3,000 years. Uh, the gray layers are precipitation over 80 millimeters. Black layers are precipitation over 90 millimeters. This is the running average of both. And uh, in colors, we have the seasonality. Uh, we have the warm season precipitation, heavy rainfall. We have the autumn precipitation, winter precipitation, and spring precipitation. And while well, we see a large variability of these, both total precipitation and uh, seasonality. But for us, the most interesting feature is the, mi the migration period. That is a period that lasted 330 years, and there were just two layers that were recorded during this period. So, well, I forgot to say that we've distinguished 1,220 heavy rainfall events in the lake, and, and we, we see that there was a strong hydrological deficit here during the migration period that also coincided with with the collapse of the Roman Empire and, and the Visigoths invasion. And we also see that during the medieval climate anomaly, there is a strong hydrological variability. We have periods with very low uh, frequency of extreme events, and then periods with very high frequency of extreme events. So this, this period is particularly, um, it has a hydrological instability during this period. We also see during the Ibero-Roman Ibero human period that precipitation is mostly controlled by um, autumn precipitation. 
And, well, since we know that Mediterranean oscillation is controlling precipitation in the area, uh, using this cold season precipitation, we can get an estimation of how the Mediterranean oscillation behaved in the past. And we see that during the migration period, there, there might be this positive-like uh, centennial scale periods of Mediterranean oscillation index. And then we have negative phases during the medieval climate anomaly. But overall, what we see is that the, the present-day hydrological deficit that we have, he, we have during the 20th century is neither acute, is not unusual in the context of the late Holocene sequence that we've studied here. We have periods such as the migration period with a stronger hydrological deficit. And just to, to sum up, in this study, we've um, provided a semi-quantitative record of stream precipitations for the last 3,000 years that is in agreement with historical records and also from uh, paleoflats documented from Iberian rivers. We've also seen, we've also got minimum precipitation thresholds for the different microphases. We've seen an increase in the frequency and magnitude of extreme events during transitional periods between the main climatic phases. We've seen that changes in the regional atmospheric circulation patterns, such as the Mediterranean oscillation, is controlling storminess uh, in this area during the Western Mediterranean. We've seen the very low frequency of storminess that appeared during the migration period, a large hydrometeorological variability during the medieval climate anomaly, and also that this reduction of storminess during the 20th century is not exceptional in the context of the last 2,800 years. So, thank you. Are you able to know, for instance, you know about precipitation, but are you able to differentiate uh, uh, the, between the duration of the events? So large precipitation rate, rate, for instance, really an event one day, or 10 days with the same amount of precipitation in 10 days? Are you able to differentiate they, this without VARPs? Yeah. Because this would be great because you will have an indication about seasonality in the yeah. Pyrenees, depending on the type of precipitation rate. Uh, well, it's, it's not possible to, to reconstruct the magnitude or the duration of the storms. Sometimes you see that you have different pulses. When you have a turbidite, you, you have different pulses of grain size that might be related to different pulses during the storm, the, the one in and waxing phases of the storms. But you cannot say if the storm was during two days or during one week. That's not okay. possible. Can we get seasonal resolution, but not, not enough. Thank you. Can I make another uh, quick one? Good. Very, very short. Very, very short. Uh, regarding your, your, your instrumental data, 15 yeah. kilometers uh, yeah. north of, of the lake, uh, don't you think that maybe you are missing some of the most convective summer storms because 15 kilometers is a um, bit it, far away? It, we, we, we do think so. But we, at the beginning, we, have, we had to decide either take a, a very local um, precipitation, uh, meteorological station that is very, it's not continuous and it covers just the last 20, 30 years, or get a complete meteorological station that we know is homogeneous. So in order to, to establish this calibration, I, we considered that that was the, the best one to do it. We, we had also meteorological station nearby, but they covered just a shorter period. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. My name is Marika Albon. And first of all, I want to thank the conveners for having the opportunity to present our work on late Holocene um, extreme rainstorms in the Dead uh, Sea Basin. So I'm a member of the Parlex project. And this Parlex project is a trilateral project and German, Israeli, and Palestinian scientists work together towards um, a better understanding of the paleohydrology and extreme events in the Dead Sea Basin. And one of the major research questions in our project is to reveal the link between extreme events and the long-term climate trend. And for this reason, um, we work on different um, time periods in the late um, Pleistocene and Holocene 
on um, Dead Sea Sediment Records. And today I want to pre present to you um, a late Holocene sediment record, um, which is marked here. So this is um, our study area. And generally, um, our study area is influenced by three synoptic systems. First of all, we have the Mediterranean cyclones. And these cyclones control the annual amount of rainfall and the distribution in the region. Then we have the tropical plumes and the active Red Sea trough coming from the south. The active Red Sea trough is a low-level pressure trough extending from eastern, eastern Africa through the Red Sea towards the eastern Mediterranean. And as you can see on this satellite image, it brings very localized heavy precipitation cells. In contrast, um, the Mediterranean cyclones and tropical plumes would produce regional scale rainstorms. So our study area is over here. It's hyperarid with a very little amount of annual rainfall and it's located um, at the Western Dead Sea escarpments. So here we are. This is the Judean Plateau and incised we have three main uh, streams. These streams are mainly dry throughout the year but carry flash floods in the rainy season during the winter months. Here we have the um, rim towards the escarpments. Here is Angedi and Angedi Spa for those who know the area. Uh, here is our coring location and this is Road 90, the, um, high, the Dead Sea Highway. And this road roughly traces the late Holocene lake level at least here at our coring location which is here. So our sediment record was recovered in the late 1990s with a total length of 21 meters but for this study, I focus on the late Holocene interval of 3,300 to 1,800 years. We calculated the stream order, and as you can see, the main um, rivers or the main um, streams are fifth and second, uh, sixth order streams, but they do not, re they do not reach our coring location, which instead is influenced by first and second order streams originating from these Dead Sea, from these uh, Western escarpments. And we look at this um, from another perspective. We have here the Judean Plateau, the escarpments, our main um, streams. Here is Angedi Spa, and our sediment record, which is located directly in front of these first and second order streams, which potentially can produce debris flows. <coughs> And we have a look at the, um, to the, towards the base of these escarpments, which looks like this. Here we have a person as a scale, it's a small person. But um, so here we have again Angedi Spa, Road 90, the Dead Sea. So we look towards Jordan, which is over here, and our current location. So this is the gravelly debris flow fan. So we are right in front of the escarpment, yeah? So it's just behind her. And so we have our debris flow fan, then cause, uh, so zone of coarse grain deposits, and a huge mud flat with fine grain deposits, um, which are considered to be the washout of, of, our, debris flow, of our debris flows. And these washout um, can reach our coring location. So then we looked at modern observations, which were published earlier by Ben David Novak. And these modern observations show that these first and second order streams can produce debris flows if two conditions are met. So first of all, we need rain directly falling on these escarpments to mobilize the sediment. Um, in contrast, if the rain would fall beyond the escarpment rim on the Judean Plateau, we would have flash floods in our main uh, streams. And the second condition is that we have to meet a threshold of at least 30 millimeter per hour for at least one hour, which is pretty high. And uh, rainstorms of this intensity are generally triggered by the um, active Red Sea trough. So now we look um, on our sediment record. Um, 
it's from 3,300 to 1,900. And previous studies showed that we have a uh, succession of annually lamination with aragonite and detrital, uh, detrital material and some modifications in this um, um, interval. And then I conducted a microfacious analysis showing that this annual uh, succession um, is intercalated by discrete graded layers, which you can see here. Um, so we have detrital material with a, clearly, uh, with a clear finding upward trend. And we could consider these uh, graded layers to be the distal um, the deposits of our debris flows. But <coughs> our graded layers just occur in this time interval roughly between 2,900 and 2,500 years BP, which uh, roughly coincides with a regional drought which was established earlier by a colleague of mine. So what we find is that we have more torrential rainstorms probably related to, to the active Red Sea droughts during generally drier conditions. And what we propose, what happens is that we observe a change in the synoptic atmospheric circulation pattern and uh, we think it happened like this, that um, the Eastern Mediterranean cyclones, which control the annual rainfall, um, redu had reduced passages over the region and caused the regional drought, and in turn favored the active Red Sea trough with more torrential rainstorms. The active Red Sea troughs uh, tends uh, generally to develop in the absence of other synoptic systems. <coughs> Then we had a look on modern data. Um, I hope you can see it. So we uh, looked at four stations, Sedem, Arad, Beersheba, and Jerusalem. And these stations have a gradient in the annual rainfall from Sedem to Jerusalem. Um, this is a table again showing our four stations. Here is the annual rainfall in Sedem, Arad, and here Jerusalem, and a threshold for um, our heavy rainfall events which trigger debris, debris flows and I introduce to you the uh, lower threshold of 30 millimeters and this, uh, this is a minimal threshold and if this threshold is um, exceeded 20% of the first and second order streams will produce debris flows. If we meet an even higher threshold of 40 millimeters um, observations show that almost all first and second order streams will produce debris flows. Then a colleague of mine calculated the return period for these for rainstorms exceeding this threshold, and we see that the return period is, is lower in the driest station compared to the moistest station, and we find again more torrential rainstorms in drier climate regions and can uh, confirm our later Lucene findings with modern data. So to sum up my talk, I presented a late Holocene record of debris flows, which allows us to identify a rainfall threshold to the um, associated rainstorm, <coughs> the location of the rainstorms, which has to be exactly over the escarpments and the triggering synoptic systems, which is most probably the active Red Sea trough. And we find more heavy rainstorms during a regional drought and we propose that this is due to a change in the synoptic atmospheric circulation pattern. Thank you. I didn't follow your age model uh, of your sequence. What is the age control of your sequence? What kind of measurements did you do? Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't mention it. We uh, had uh, radiocarbon ages. Pardon? Pardon? We had several gradient carbon ages and a floating buff chronology um, anchored to these gradient carbon ages. Is there the possibility for hard water effects in your chronology, maybe? Um, no, they uh, used um, terrestrial plant remains. Oh, okay, thank you. I have a question. The Eastern Mediterranean cyclones are winter rains? Are they winter, winter rains, the Western Mediterranean? Um, generally, um, the rainfall season is during the winter months, maybe roughly October to mm -hmm. March. So, yes. And the Dead Sea uh, throughout is summer or 
The Dead Sea what? The, the, the other uh, uh, patterns, the Dead Sea uh, throat is summer rain or? No, usually the um, uh, rainfall is in winter, so the summer is generally dry. Okay. Well, to place ourselves on the map, we are here. This is the southern part of the foreign <coughs> basin, and it's called Llano de Mojos. This is a very flat area. It is a seasonally flat savanna, that, which is crossed by many, many paleo rivers and also active rivers. To get an idea, this is a modest image during the rain season. So all the blackish area are flood savanna. And this is the Mamore River, which is the main river that drains these uh, this plains. And over here, this seasonal floods cause a lot of economic damages in, in the area. And the seasonal floods are partly, partly controlled at the dynamic of, of this uh, this seasonal flood is partly controlled by the, the Henso activity. And uh, a few years ago, there was this uh, influential paper from Alto et al. And they say that the way in which the Henso controls this flooding influences the sedimentation record. And they looked at the sedimentation record along with the Mamore and the Beni River, which are the two biggest rivers in, in the region. And they found that during the La Nina events, there is formation of crevasses plays, and there is more of a bank sedimentation. So they concluded that among the Amazonian floodplains, the sedimentation record is, is part of the result of uh, the ENSO. So I'm interested in, in reconstructing the evolution of the landscape in this area. And uh, as you see, most of the area is crossed by tributaries of the, the sorry, the, by the tributaries of the Mamore River. And all the paleo rivers we found here belongs to the funds that this tributary forms. So using the, the archive we have from Landsat imagery, I looked at what happened to these 12 tributaries during the last 30 years. And I'll show just two examples. This is the Sequoia River in 1986. You see here there is a little spill. So this is a crevasse formed. 10 years later, there is already a course formed. In 2009, the river had a complete avulsion, so this is uh, abandoned, and it's like looking for a new course, and in this looking for a new course, it's flooding all the area, but this kind of flood is a flood that brings a lot of sediments, as you see here in this little part. And by 2014, the river, th this part is completely abandoned, the river has this new course, but as you see, this is a very immature, course. So every season, every rainy season, we have new crevasses and new avulsions happening here till the, the meandering pattern is reestablished. Same thing happened for all the other rivers. I just show another example. This is Rio Grande. And during the last 30 years, we have six complete avulsions. And again, all the sediments of Rio Grande are dropped in the floodplain in this area where the evolution, the crevasses plays are taking place. So the, mo the, the first conclusion is that most of the sediments eroded from the Andes is deposited in the alluvial plains before it reaches the Mamore. And this is done by the crevasses plays and the evolutions. Then I look at the relation between the formation of crevasses and the Enso events. And I didn't find any correlation. So basically the accretion of the alluvium place is not controlled by ENSO. These tributaries respond to intrabasinal dynamics that what we see in the last 30 years is not uh, related with ENSO. And I don't know, of course, there, there must be some climate influence of it, on, on it, but it's not El Nino. So let's look now at what happened during the Holocene. So we change completely the, the scale and we look at, at the millennial scale. So as I said, this area of the, 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 the Leon de Mojos has been built by three rivers, it's the, the, Madi, the, 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 the Maniki, the Segre, and the Rio Grande. So what we did was a transect. It's a 300 kilometers long transect across, well, from the, 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 the Piedmont of the Andes toward the Llanos. So we got many cores, about 35 or 36 cores. And almost all of them go through one or more paleosols. And we took 
radiocarbonates of almost all of these pyrosols. And the interpretation, I mean, pyrosol is important because when we have a pyrosol, we have a pyrosurface that have been covered with sediments, and these sediments have been deposited because a crevasse spray or an avulsion took place. So the amount of pyrosol we find is a proxy of river activity somehow. And when we plot the histogram of the amount of pyrosols we found, we see that 50% of all the pyrosols are concentrated between 4,000 and 2,000 BP. So we basically have like six, 7,000 years of relatively little fluid activity. Then we have a peak in fluid activity that lasts these 2,000 years. And then uh, this 2,000 years from 4,000 to 2,000. And then during the last 2,000, we have again like little fluvial activity. So as this is a multidisciplinary session, I want to, to compare this fluvial archive with the archaeological archive. And I find fascinating that we have exactly the same chronology in the archaeological archive. This is a stratigraphy of Shell Midden. This is a hunter-gatherer site. Is they, they start building these sites 10,500 BP, and people were, were there till 4,000 BP. And during this human presence, we have soil formation here. Then we have 2,000 years of hiatus in the archaeological record. So people just went away, are not there. And then we have a lot of, of archaeological evidence from the last 2,000 years. Here you see all these lines here, the stripes. This is, these are pre-Columbian agricultural fields. And these kind of earthworks are found all over the Liao de Mojos. So this is an indication that during the last 2,000 years, this feature, this landscape has not been covered with fluvial sediments. So basically, we have the archaeological record and the fluvial record that are telling the same story. We have somehow like uh, soil formation, stability in the landscape for 6,000 years, 2,000 years of big changes and river activity, and then another 2,000 years, the last 2,000, again, soil formation, human occupation, and little fluid activity. And this is as far as what happened. So why? This is the, the, the second question. So if we compare this record with, this is a speleotherm that has been taken in Peru, and this is the closest speleotherm I know uh, to, to to this area. We see that at 4,000, we have a change in the, in, the, in the variability of precipitation. And this is basically the onset of the strengthening of the, the Enso. So it, it looks like that, of course, the, 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 the climate is getting wetter and wetter, and this maybe can explain this increase we see here. But this peak seems to be related with the onset of the, the Enso, although, from 4,000 to 2,000 is not so much different from what we see during the last 2,000 years. So we don't know that there is no, for me, there is no climatic explanation for this drop in fluid activity that we see at 2,000 BP. So maybe we should add neotectonics to this reconstruction. And I hope this is something I can talk about in the next pages. Thank you very much. <laughs> Umberto, would it, would it also make sense to look at the dynamics of the Atlantic Ocean? You, you're looking at the Enzo, but we know that in this area it's just a key area in the transition between the Pacific and the Atlantic influence, and would it make sense also to look at the Atlantic dynamics? Yeah, yes, of course, and there are several papers from Yosin, uh, I don't remember the surname, and about the, 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 the flooding pattern being controlled by the, 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 the uh, yeah, and not by Enzo. So this kind of discussion on what is controlling the, 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 the flooding pattern, it, it's open. And actually, the largest flood on record we have in, in the Leone Mogos was 2014, and it was not an Enzo event. <laughs> have you studied the development of the palo soils, the degree, intensity of the weathering? If well, kind uh, of, of soil. 
Uh, yes and no, in, in the sense we are uh, now using these paleosols as paleoecological archives. So what we are, well, we already did uh, the uh, stable carbon isotopes and we are looking at the phytoliths now. So the, the, what we are doing now, it's trying to, to use the organic matter and, 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 and micro fossils to reconstruct the type of vegetation and see if we have the same pattern of forest savanna that we see nowadays in the past. What we do have is of course a lot of red mottling, oxidation, because most of these soils are, are uh, underwater during six or seven months, so you have a lot of red oxy, uh, things going on, and you have a lot of overprinting. So it's very difficult because the water table changes, of course, every year, but it also changes all, uh, across the millennia, so it's... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, and the, 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 the paleosols very often are quite close to the surface. So it means one meter or one and a half meter below the surface. So they are also within this uh, oscillation of the water table. Yeah, I, I would, it's, it's, I had the same question. I'm very absolutely fascinated by this work. Um, the thing is, um, this paleosoils uh, of the intensity, what you mentioned, mm -hmm. this, this is one thing. So, if you leave that out, uh, the number of paleosoils, is this uh, a number for stability, or is it a proxy for stability, or is it a reverse, that you say that this paleosoil, the higher the number is of the paleosoils, and more this soil uh, development is interrupted by floods, is it more? more floods and more numbers of floods or less floods? What is the interpretation? I didn't get that. Yeah, to the, make it clear. when Thanks. we have uh, like, uh, less in this, yeah, well, oh, sorry, well this is a bit, but when you have uh, like in these cases, like five pilosols in the same core, that means that at least five times there was an evolution here because the surface has been covered five times in that very place. If you have just one pilosol, like, uh, well, I don't know, in this case, this pilosol, this is, there is no radical carbon age here, but because I got just the date a few days ago, this is 8,000 BP. So in this case, we have that there was an evolution 8,000 years ago, but then nothing happened during 8,000 years from the point of view of, of the movement of the rivers. So the number of pilosols, in my view, are an indication of the, 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 the speed at which the river is changing courses. So in a hypothetical case, there were no river evolution during the last 10,000 years, we wouldn't find any paleosols. Because we would have the, the soil of uh, the Pleistocene soil, <laughs> maybe. My name is Alicia Dekali. I'm from the University of Sydney in Australia. And a slight title change today, I'll be presenting some research we've been doing on a high-resolution paleo flood record uh, from the Murray Downing Basin in Australia, a proxy record of Southern Hemisphere Holocene hydroclimate. So moving to the Southern Hemisphere here. So we started this research um, when we were down there in the Murray River investigating riverbank failure that occurred at the peak of the Millennium Drought. Uh, banks usually fail during high flow conditions, not low flow conditions, so this was an interesting story and conundrum in itself, but a story for another time. Uh, whilst we were there, we discovered a paleo flood record for the Murray Darling Basin in a really intriguing depositional environment of the fluvial um, river system. And this is the story I'll be talking about today. So the Murray Darling Basin drains 14% of eastern Australia. Um, it's comprised, it's, sh it's shown here in the blue shading. It's comprised of the Murray and Darling sub-basins, the Murray in the south and the Darling in the north. And it drains, sorry, it extends across climatically and geologically distinct regions, with northeastern Australia draining more mafic lithologies in direct comparison to southeastern Australia draining more uh, felsic lithologies. Precipitation is driven uh, by southern hemisphere synoptic scale climate drivers in northeastern Australia, represented by the cross hatching here. Um, the Australian Summer Monsoon, Indian Ocean Diapole, ENSO and the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation um, control or influence rainfall uh, in the summer, whereas in southeastern Australia, represented by the black circles here, uh, precipitation is mainly driven by the southern annual mode and the southern westerlies. Uh, the basin is known as, Australia, as, as the nation's food bowl. It's agriculturally really important. 
Uh, water security is therefore a really contentious issue and management is currently based on a 110 year instrumental stream flow record. But recent research has revealed uh, that longer and more frequent wet and dry periods have been experienced in the pre-instrumental record. And so understanding basin response to this full scale um, or spectrum of climatic variability is really crucial for adaptive management and water security issues. Currently, paleo discharge reconstructions rely on proxy uh, records located outside of the basin. And today I'm presenting the first in situ one down, uh, located at the terminus of the system in South Australia. So here we are for the Lower Murray River. Uh, we collected sediment cores and CPTs and along this about 150 kilometre reach. CPTs or cone penetrometers are an in situ uh, method of determining soil behaviour type, as these were initially intended for geotechnical analysis. But in this case, we use them to extend the reach of what we obtained um, from our sediment cores, which were relatively short, two to four metres. If we visualise this longitudinally in the valley, um, from about 70 kilometres upstream, so from Wellington up to about Morgan, we can see where our sediment cores, the red markers, and the um, CPTs, the orange markers, sit stratigraphically within the upper valley fill here. Uh, the upper valley fill has been described as um, coarse bed low deposits of uh, meandering Holocene paleo channels, so as Holocene in age. When we look at the sediments, though, first thing we noticed about all our sediment cores regionally collected was that they were laminated. We had very fine-grained um, clays, or, or light grey laminae, sorry, interbedded within an olive black background with some presence of unconformities. There was no evidence of biotubation, no pedogenesis or paleosols, um, and no oxidation within the sequences anywhere. So it's suggesting really rapid sedimentation in a low energy lake type environment um, with um, long residence times and low sediment remobilization. When we look to the CPTs, which extended the reach of the sediment cores, this is all the data points um, displayed on a soil behavior type chart. And you can see that the majority of data points lie within the silty and clay mixtures, almost 20,000, and really few that actually are identifying as sandy mixtures. So in terms of our fluvial environment, we've got regionally laminated fine-grained sediments, which is really calling into question the depositional nature of the fluvial environment. Um, and at this stage, we're suggesting that we had a, a, an elongate and a backwater environment existent for much of the Holocene. Again, a geomorphic story for another time. We chose two cores to do a multi-proxy multi analysis uh, for paleo flood assessment, River Glen um, and East Front Road, and some radiocarbon dating we undertook uh, confirmed that they were Holocene in age. These are the two cores here. And um, the, the cores return to basal age uh, that was mid-Holocene in age, but we do know that we have laminations and from the CPTs, we know that we have a laminated sequence continuing to depth below the um, mid-Holocene, so therefore extending into the early Holocene. With our multi-proxy approach, we identified three distinct faces, looking at grain size, clay mineralogy, geochemistry, and radiocarbon at this stage. Uh, the grey laminae we uh, termed faces A, which are the ones that are interbedded within the olive black uh, background muds, faces B, and then this slightly coarser deposit, faces C, which is associated with the unconformities in the sequence, um, and is, um, which I'll go into in a minute. So in terms of the physical properties and the grain size, um, faces A, the light grey laminae, are really clay rich in direct comparison to the background muds, which are much more silt rich. And then the face you see has a mixture of these clay and silt components, but then also a very fine grained sand component associated with this um, coarser lag deposit. In terms of the clay mineralogy, uh, based on existing literature, we were expecting to see a differentiation in um, the faces A and B sediments uh, between smectite and illite, and this was supported um, for faces uh, B but we didn't see a full distinction of smectite between the samples. Smectite um, in indication of the clay mineralogy, the Darling versus the Murray at the confluence here as, a, as an example. So for further work to be done. We undertook geochemistry, um, geochemical analysis using ITRAX XRF and principal components analysis. And just a quick note here on the data treatment, the raw data was normalized against the molybdenum incoherent and coherent scattering and is presented here as log ratios of element intensities which permits the multivariate analysis. Um, so, principal component one in core RG2 and PC2 in core East Front Road um, best captured the detrital signal that we saw, representing over 19 and 17% of the total variability. The take home message here is that we have a geochemical signature that we've delineated that really represents the distinct um, geologically, uh, geological catchments of the Darling in the north and the Murray in the south. So, faces A 
had a similar geochemical signature between both cores and had a major enrichment in iron, which is supporting the presence of smectite, which is although unconfirmed, and is identifying um, suspended sediments from uh, mafic lithologies of northeastern Australia and the Darling. Indirect comparison to phases B, which again was similar between the two cores with an enrichment in uh, potassium and rubidium, and um, was again supporting an illite presence, uh, identifying suspended sediments from more felsic lithologies of southeastern Australia and the Murray River system. So what we have here is a geochemical signature that reflects the hydrological regime of the Murray-Darling Basin. We've got phases A, which is the iron enriched rich smectites, a proxy for Darling and Pelly floods, which are episodically overwhelming and overprinting on the background phases B sediments, which have a dominance of more clay, so uh, of, sorry, Murray River and um, southeastern Australian sources. In terms of phases C, they had a mixed geochemical signature, and we're interpreting these as um, exceptionally high energy events that are interrupting the low energy environment and um, causing erosion of the deposit, of this fine-grained cohesive deposit, uh, contributing to hiatus within the record and then uh, depositing its lag deposit on top. High transition losses from the headwaters of these catchments to the terminus where we picked up this record suggests that we're recording peak flood behavior and extreme hydrological events for the system. And so we've discovered the first in situ, um, a high resolution Pelly flood record for the Murray Darling Basin, which can be used to validate and hindcast the 110 year stream flow record and current paleoclimate reconstructions that exist remotely. Um, what does this mean? If we translate this for our paleoclimate potential, the suspended sediments being a proxy for paleo floods, being a proxy for precipitation, we have a, a far field proxy record of Holocene hydroclimate for the Murray Darling Basin and Eastern Australia, and more importantly, the, the Southern Hemisphere because of the climate drivers. Faces A representing um, a northeastern precipitation driven by the Australian Summer Monsoon, IOD, ENSO, and IPO, in a distinct comparison to um, Faces B, which uh, is representing precipitation more driven by the southern annular mode and the westerlies. Uh, when we look at Faces C, these exceptionally high energy events, whether they represent storminess, um, uh, over, for example, the northeastern uh, catchment in terms of cyclones, tropical cyclones, or perhaps record wet phases where we have both catchments precipitating at the same time. Um, we're not sure at this stage, but with, is, we should be able to decipher this interaction between the climatic states uh, because of the geochemical signature that's coming through. This is a bit of a busy image, but if we're um, just going to focus on the longer record here, I'll be riddled with hiatuses. Um, and um, the composite record that we've built from the uh, grain size and the geochemistry, but unfortunately not the mineralogy as of yet. Comparing uh, sedimentation from the mid Holocene to the late period and then into the modern, we can see an increasing uh, dominance of a contribution or influence from the Darling catchment and therefore from northeastern um, Australian uh, climate drivers, which is possible to interpret. Before we actually pull out a paleo flood frequency from this and, in, and pull out a paleoclimate record, um, we first need to validate this uh, record against existing, uh, existing records. And in order to do, the, to do this, I think we need a longer and con a more continuous sequence um, that has less hiatus within the record. It would be nice regionally across the two cores or across numer uh, numerous cores to um, confirm regionally coherent events within the, within the area. We need tighter age control as well using OSL dating. Um, these ones are based on radiocarbon ages and some charcoal within some of these samples, samples has contributed to a few age reversals. I think we also really need to understand the baseline contribution of the flows to the system. We always have the Murray and the Darling River uh, catchments flowing at the same time, but what's the flood that overprints this? And further, ge the geomorphic constraints on this um, intriguing depositional environment, as at this stage we're not sure what's controlling um, the laminate settling in a fluvial environment. Um, as we've got a low energy receiving basin, we think it's deco uh, recording decadal variability in terms of the, the, sediment, the laminate that it's recording. However, um, I can't get these sediments to settle in a lab, let alone in a, in a natural environment. And so how uh, are the sediments being deposited through underflows, interflows or overflows, um, so, some bypassing the system? We really need to tie that down before we uh, decide on its um, uh, resolution, I guess. Now, in terms of how this can contribute to the more broader glo global climate debate for Southern Hemisphere climate, um, Southern Hemisphere climate and uh, more specifically Eastern Australia climate, from the early to mid Holocene, we have wetter and, uh, and warmer conditions transitioning in the mid to late Holocene to more increased climatic variability and enhanced aridity. And the placement of our record can be potentially really powerful for this period because it can really shed light on the interactions um, that we're seeing for Southern Hemisphere climate for the Holocene spanning the Holocene. 
Um, we're confident it spans the Holocene because uh, we've got evidence to suggest that it continues below the mid-Holocene in terms of the, st the stratigraphy. Um, regionally, we should be able to find a continuous record that's quite high resolution. We think we've got decadal variability, so capturing Enzo variability in there over millennial timescales, and um, it should have the uh, ability to be a regionally coherent archive as well. So potentially a really powerful um, a, a new record that can contribute to the Southern Hemisphere climate debate and really work at disentangling the synchronous and asynchronous behaviour of the Southern Hemisphere climate drivers over millennial timescales. So just to conclude, um, we have a, really, a geomorphically really intriguing environment. Uh, we hope to better understand the, dynam the dynamics of the system to constrain and decipher the record. We have the first uh, high resolution in situ paleo flood record for the Murray-Darling Basin, which can be used to validate and hind cast um, streamflow, and will capture the full spectrum of hydroclimatic variability for the Murray-Darling Basin, and a potentially really powerful archive of Southern Hemisphere Holocene hydroclimate from which we can disentangle the synchronous and asynchronous behaviour of um, specific climate drivers for the Holocene. Thank you. I cannot follow your um, climatological interpretation for the uh, millennial scales, or did you present an interpretation already? I didn't follow. It's, it's because it's unvalidated, because we're not sure, we don't have enough age control. It's not necessarily uh, a robust interpretation, it's perhaps just an inference that um, because we have an increasing dominance in, in sediments that are identifying as those sourced from northeastern Australia, so driven by ENSO and the IPO and I, IOD. Um, I'm, I perhaps didn't spend long enough on this, but there's an increasing frequency or contribution um, in the late Holocene to then the modern um, sedimentation, but it's based on inference at this stage because we have no control and no validation, so it's in its very early stages, and we really discovered this deposit while looking at bank failure, so it's it's the next step, absolutely. Just out of curiosity, how many principal components did the analysis return? Really interestingly, a lot. Um, it returned about 11, um, which were significant if there was the eigenvalue over mm -hmm. one. Um, I've done a, some work subsequently to this to try and narrow it down by removing a few elements by doing a correlation prior to. Um, I think a lot of, I mean, that was the major detrital uh, component that it returned, PC1 and PC2 for the cores, um, but because of the depositional environment, I mean, ITRAX is used to infer um, uh, uh, many different kind of, you know, organic phases as well and turnover in lakes, and I think it's picking up a lot of that kind of stuff as well. I haven't gone into that um, depth yet in terms of the exploration of the depositional environment, but there were a lot to tease, and I don't think they're all significant necessarily. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Carlos. I'm going to talk about historical floods in two catchments in southeastern Spain. So this is the summary of the presentation. I introduct, I, I'm doing a, a few introduction of the subject. Uh, I introduce you the, the study area and document sources and, and the results in flood magnitudes and a few conclusions. Here we have two, two pictures. The first one is a um, Historical Archive is a, a historical document survey from Vera Archives. It's dated in, it's from uh, the beginning of 16th century. And the next one, it's from Antas Archives and in the, the last uh, of the uh, 19th century. So as an introduction, uh, the southeastern of Spain, of the uh, Iberian Peninsula, is the driest region in, in Europe, in the continental re uh, Europe. And despite low annual precipitation, there are some catastrophic floods, like in the picture, we can see the damage uh, that in 2012 uh, caused this, this flood event. This is the bridge, an old bridge in the Antas town, uh, and it, uh, it almost um, uh, had destruct be because of the, the flood event. So from historical source, uh, we arrived, uh, we can go back to, to uh, the beginning of the uh, 16th century in Vera and Cueva settlements and the middle of 18th century in, in Antas settlement. Antas is a, a, very, a very little, a very small lab town. So the, the aims of this study is to reconstruct flat events by means of the docu documentary written source, which include uh, descriptions of damage to buildings, um, uh, agricultural fields, and human losses. And also we have another aim to classify uh, flood events according to the magnitude, so the descriptions of, of the damage. 
Uh, we have one hypothesis uh, that is in the last 25 years, uh, the land uses change uh, have raised the number of lower magnitude events and have increased the rest of them. Uh, 25 years uh, is because uh, in 1999, almost 30 years now, uh, it was uh, built a uh, reservoir in, in the last part of the, of the Almanzora catchment. So this is the study area. We have two basins. The largest, the, the biggest one, is uh, Almanzora Basin. The, is the main stream reach uh, more than 100 kilometers, and the basin area is uh, more than two and a half um, a square kilometer, uh, a thousand square kilometers. Um, the, the, the maximum peak of height is in Calar Alto, it's almost uh, 2,000 millimeters, uh, meters, sorry. And the, the small one is Antas uh, Catchment, it's only 40 kilometers, and the, the basin area is 261 two, two uh, square kilometers. We have to take into account that uh, the, precip the, precip the precipitation, sorry, annual precipitation, it's in, in Cuevas, it's less than, than 300 uh, millimeters. So here we have the documentary source. We have four pictures about them. Uh, the flood events have been identified from ordinary and extraordinary proceedings. And from the municipalities, we can divide in, in, three, in three parts, in three basins. The first one, maybe, it could be the Antas Basin, it's Antas and Vera uh, muni uh, segments from Almanzora River, it's Cuevas and Albox, and we also uh, went to, to uh, the Anta Al Our River, Our, it's in the south of, of Antas uh, River, it's Mojaca over Santurre, and in the near future we will be able to, to reconstruct uh, the data series like in, in Antas on Almanzora. There are some old newspapers also, it, it started in, in, the, in the middle of of uh, 19th century, more or less, 19, 1860, the first one, and there are some technical reports about the, of, of the, the, catastrophic, uh, the catastrophic floods, like in 1979, it was the, the, the biggest one, 1973, and, and of course in, in the last one in, in 2012. So here we have two pictures. The first one is from Minero de Almagreda. It was a, a historical uh, old newspaper. We have here the, the word uh, inundation, it's like flood, inundation, and here, sorry, here we have the, the description of the, of the damage in, in the village, in Cuevas. And the next picture, the next fi uh, picture, it's a, a technical report from the, in, from the flood in 1899. Uh, here we have not any word like flood, inundation, or in Spanish, avenida, but we have the description, the de description of, of the damage. So when we can obtain this type of, of data, we have to look at uh, before and after in the, the proceedings to, to, to know what, which is the, with the damages. This, uh, this um, description is from the, the flood event in 1879. <coughs> in the, according to flag flag magnitudes, uh, the classification of flag magnitudes according to the descriptions that have been compiled from the study area in the, in the segments that I, I mentioned it, uh, before. And according to the number of, of recorded floods, we can divide it in two periods. Uh, the first one is from the beginning of the uh, 16th century, when, when the, the proceedings started, uh, and, and finish in, in 1850, more or less, when the, the local newspapers starts. And so, from this date of 1850 until the present, we have a lot of descriptions, we have a, a lot of uh, accuracy in these uh, descriptions, so we can uh, reconstruct uh, the, the most catastrophic uh, uh, floods. Uh, to this chest of historical floods were estimated, in, taking into account the flood magnitude, um, um, the flood magnitude classification and instrumental data, data from Santa Barbara Gaudian Station. Here we have the picture. This is the, the Gaudian Station. It's near the bridge, the Santa Barbara Bridge. It was destructed in, in the, the flat event in, in 1973. So to classify these this, uh, flat events, we have two factors. Factor number one is the, the main factor, and factor number two. And according to these factors, we can obtain magnitude one, two, and three. And after I, I'm going to talk about four, it's, it's a bit different. So to, to classify like uh, magnitude one, it's these flat events that only affect to agriculture plots near the riverbank. 
and Manito too is this uh, agricultural plot uh, also, but which are not near the river bank. The river bank. But there are also uh, the factor number two is damage in the buildings and hydraulic infrastructure like um, water mills. Uh, in magnitude three is uh, caused uh, fatalities and high impact, uh, economic impact and partial or complete destruction of, of the towns. Uh, so to magnitude four, we have to, to take into account that th these floods events that caused damage in more than one uh, subvention or, or a stretch. In the case that of uh, Antas, there are not there are no um, uh, two basins or subvention in Antas town in Antas river. So these flat events that reach magnitude three with this uh, description, if these events uh, affect to two subvention or two stretch, we add a plus one, so it's uh, magnitude four. Here we have the, the data series completely. We can see this, uh, the, 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 the second period, a, cluster, a very big cluster of, of uh, description of flat events, but we can obtain some several uh, clusters. The first one is uh, since uh, 1647 to 1676, there are four uh, flat events and two of them are magnitude three. The, the next, uh, flat, flat cluster is uh, since 1750 to 1780. There are only three uh, flood events. One of them is uh, magnitude three. But during this period, uh, the Almanzora River uh, go, went to uh, when, with a good amount of, of discharge. And this is in the in the archives. The next uh, cluster is from 1870 to the beginning of 20th uh, century. This is the main uh, cluster. We have a lot of information in this cluster. Uh, there are seven uh, flood events of magnitude three, and one of them is the 1879 flood event that reached uh, magnitude four. So uh, according to the, to the old newspapers, we can uh, reconstruct the, the mostly of, the, of these uh, flood events. The last two clusters, I divided, I could um, make one cluster, but I make two because of the construction of the reservoir. So the, the first one is 1969 to 1977. There are uh, a lot of uh, flat events in only eight years, and the biggest one is 1973. And the last uh, cluster is the, the 1989 until the present. We have also a lot of um, uh, descriptions, a lot of uh, flat events, but we have this one, the last one is uh, the flat event in, in 2012. It was a, a very huge uh, um, flat event because of the, the land use, it, it was changed. So here we have the, the, this chart. We have here the black line shows the, the, the um, instrumental data from Santa Barbara coaching. So with this data, we estimated the all uh, discharges according to the magnitude. Uh, so the, the magnitude one could be uh, is uh, 138 uh, cubic meters. The magnitude three is uh, 1,300 cubic meters, and the magnitude three, uh, three, this is second three, is uh, 3,600 uh, millimeters. But we have a peak, a maximum peak in the 1973. It was, uh, it's, it's an intru instrumental data. It was 5,600 uh, uh, cubic meters. It's, but so these four uh, events that reach this magnitude is because we have uh, the description that it was, uh, the description is like in 70, 1973. So as a conclusion, we can see, say that historical sources have contributed uh, to identify and obtain uh, extensive description of flood uh, events. From this data, we will proceed to reconstruct the uh, flood area. Like in 1973, uh, the, the last uh, flood, uh, flood event in, in 2012, we are doing now, and the changes in land use in, in, in the last 25 years caused an increase of damage, mostly in the coastal tourist area. The analysis of flood uh, uh, cluster show a prediversity of approximately uh, 100 years, and finally, the sedimentary analysis will be used in order uh, to improve the information of, of the past floods. Thank you very much. I think you have to take care. Um, 
at the recent period, so in the period of the 19th century and 20th century, that you do not overestimate the flood events because you have more information than in the periods before. Yes. And probably you also have more infrastructure that can be destructed. So mm. do you have a methodology how to to correct this, this overestimation in the recent period? Yes, when, when I obtained this data from uh, 16th century, uh, 17th century, uh, the, the description uh, also described uh, which, is the, which are the, the buildings that damaged. And yes, uh, we take into account these this changes in the buildings and the, the agriculture also, yes. I just wanted to ask about the ranking one and two based on the agricultural land or the impact. Is that because that was what tended to be written about, that there was more comments about the impact on agriculture than anything else. Uh, yes, uh, because this agriculture is near the, the river bank, but near it maybe uh, five meters. So it's, uh, the, the, the level of the river reached this uh, agriculture, but not the, the, the agriculture that are not near the river bank, maybe 100 meters uh, the, the distance. So, so you could sort of map it in a physical sense. There was a physical yes, yes. reason for doing yes. that as well. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much again. What do you want? Yeah. I think the last question: When you say lands use change over the last 25 years, are you talking about uh, on uh, on the catchment, or are you talking about on the floodplains? Uh, no, I'm I'm talking about uh, the, the the catchment. And also, the, the flat uh, caused more damage because uh, it's built in, in near the river, the river bank. But so you are talking about near the river, not on the on the whole catchment. Because in the past, at the historical uh, timing, hmm. there are other timing, other times with uh, very dramatic change on land use, particularly on the 19th century. Yeah. But if you are talking about along the river, that's true. That uh, the this occupation of the floodplains recently, especially in, 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 in the coastal areas. So. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you for having the opportunity to give a talk here. As you can see, it's going to be about the reconstruction of magnitude and long-term seasonal variability of pre-instrumental floods based on documentary evidence uh, in Switzerland. So, to sum it up in the beginning, this presentation, it's going to be a history about a long-term river profile stability, also a long-term discharge condition stability, and uh, a very recent but very distinctive anthropogenic alteration of the whole um, hydrological system. So we're going to have a closer look at the 13th to the 21st century at different sites for different rivers in Switzerland. So just to the content, uh, I'll give a short overview about the research area, very short very short introduction in the data that we use and the methodology that um, we developed and applied to reconstruct peak water levels, uh, peak flood water levels, and then assess the peak discharge of this flood event. Then I'm going to show you some preliminary results. The, the project is going to end this June, so it's a little bit um, further developed than last year uh, when I had a similar uh, presentation at Grenoble in the kickoff conference of the flood working group. So it's going to be about reconstruction of, of extreme flood events of major Swiss rivers and uh, the last point, reconstruction of long-term seasonality of smaller flood events based on the weekly lead books of expenditures of the city of Basel. So this was the state in two, uh, sorry, this was the state in 2006. The green dots represent, represented at that time the dots that we already analyzed. So we analyzed River and Sane, the, the down part of River Are, then uh, River Reuss, River Limmat, River Seal, and one uh, place in Basel. And the red dots were not analyzed then. Now we progressed a little bit. So the only red point we have here is uh, Arau. I'm waiting for a, for a master thesis. The results of a master thesis is going on there. So we will have very soon this result for River Are at the town of Arau as well. <coughs> so oh, to the data methodology part. Um, so it's basically it's about combining documentary evidence um, and to reconstruct flood levels and then uh, look for historical river profiles to 
assess and to, to calculate the, the discharge. So we are using narrative and institutional documentary evidence. This could be chronicle reports or accounting books. So we use also paintings, if available, and photos in the 19th century. And for sure, we are using flood marks, if available. Uh, the historical river profiles in Switzerland usually in the bigger towns are available since the early 19th century and in, several, in some cases or since the late um, 18th century. We believe them, in most cases we check it naturally, but we believe them to be, to, be, um, to show still the, the, the situation of the pre-instrumental period. <coughs> Um, this is uh, uh, the, uh, just uh, to see the uh, qualitative calibration approach, which we developed. So you have here the time period. This dotted line represents the differentiation between the instrumental period and the pre-instrumental period. Um, on the bottom, in green, we have instrumental measurements. This is the situation for most bigger, more, most, more important um, um, cities like Basel, Bern, uh, Lucerne, Zurich. And then have, we have here in blue flood marks, in red flood reports from chroniclers, chronicle reports or um, 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 journals, and additional information to flood causes, which are here instrumental. And the further back you go in time, the more these are narrative reports again. Um, you see here that we have an overlap in those cases um, uh, between the pre-instrumental flood information systems, so flood marks, narrative reports, and this documentary evidence related to flood causes, um, and the instrumental measurement. And we use this to calibrate the pre-instrumental flood information systems. And once we have calibrated it, we go to the uh, reconstruction period, which is the pre-instrumental period, and then we construct the pre-instrumental flood marks and the, also the pre-instrumental narrative flood reports. I could go much more into detail here, but I do not have the time for it, so please feel free after the presentation to ask me. Um, I will be happy to tell you all about what you want to know. So, but for, for now, this is all. So the first result I'm going to show you, it's uh, from a study from 2011. It's a 750-year series of reconstructed river rhine discharges at the site of Basel and we see a trend of decreasing flood magnitudes over time. So we were looking for reasons for this decrease in flood magnitude and we found that in 1714 River Condor was deviated to Lake Thun and in 1874 River Aare was deviated to Lake Biel, uh, 78, sorry, to Lake Biel. So River Aare is the most important uh, tributary to River Rhine and we then thought, okay, this could be the reason for this decrease in flood magnitudes. Um, if we draw these two river corrections in this graph here, we see um, definitely after um, lake, after river counter correction, um, flood magnitudes around 6,000 to 6,400 cubic meters did not take, take place anymore in Basel. And after the other correction to Lake Beal, we have a new normal here around 5,000 cubic meter. Before it was around 5,500 cubic meter. So we have now more data, not only at the site of Basel. So if this is a correct reconstruction we did in Basel, it should somehow also be uh, reproducible at other sites, upstream of River Rhine and River Aare. So what we have here is uh, Thun, Burn, Thun is right uh, at the outflow of Lake Thun, um, situated. Burn is some kilometers further downstream. Solothurn, again, some kilometers further downstream. Those two um, uh, sites, um, we shouldn't see the influence of the um, first Jura waters correction because it's upstream, but we should see the influence of the counter correction. And in fact, in Thun, we somehow see it, and in Bern we see it. So before counter correction here, the level was here, um, and after the counter correction, um, we have a new normal. Um, further downstream, we should see both. We should see the influence of um, counter correction, uh, and we see it. 
here before counter correction, after counter correction, and after first two robot is correction. And the same is also true for Alton before counter correction, after counter correction, new normal after first two robot is correction. So if you have a look at the Rhine, we don't see it anymore. <laughs> if you go further upstream than Basel, we don't see it. Stein am Rhein is situated at Lake Constance, and we shouldn't see it. This is a good sign. And we don't see it as well in Schaffhausen, some kilometers further downstream. The, the, hugest, the biggest event is 1817, caused by the uh, year without the summer in 1816. So we had two snow layers in the Alps, which then melted in 1817 and caused the by far hugest flood since the last 500 years in, in this area. If you go further downstream the river, we see this two-step decrease again. So Laufenburg is, is after the influence of river, of, of river Aare. Then we see this here, and after the first two robots correction, we have this here. Rheinfelden, some kilometers upstream of Basel, two-step decrease of the flood magnitudes. So let's switch um, the area, just to give another example. I did an analysis for the, the city of Zurich. This was the first output. So we reconstructed um, River Limont and Lake Zurich um, flood levels. Um, and we see a similar. This is caused uh, because in 1807 to 1811, they deviated uh, the major tributary um, which is Lindt River to this lake here, to uh, Lake Walen, and then we see similar development as we see because of the additional retention capacity as we see here, saw here in Basel. So this is at Wesen, right at Lake Walen, before the correction, after the correction, Lake Zurich before the correction, after the correction, and then there are several more um, anthropogenic changes here, so we have like, like a development going down. And we see it up to the influence of, of river limit to river Aare. So to the final point, premium river results, reconstruction of long-term seasonality of small flood events um, based on weekly led books of expenditures. That's how they look. They are available from, from 1401 to 1799. And on this page here, the important information is written here. And it means they paid three pounds, one shilling, for day and night wage for workmen because of the great rain. So, rain. so this is a flood information, um, which we didn't get by the chronicle reports. So, so far, we analyzed the period from 1600 to 1650 completely. And we found 23 times more river rain flood events than were reported by chronicle reports. So 70 flood um, um, mentioning in these uh, city accounts and only three were reported by um, chroniclers. Because chroniclers only report about the very huge events, the big events. If there is no flooding, if there is no destruction, they don't report it. But here everything that somehow um, costs money it's, it's written there inside. So they paid these workmen, these craftsmen, to guard the bridge. They needed to guard the bridge for some nights and days, and they didn't do it without money, so they needed to pay them, and that's why they, they are in there. Um, for, I was quite sure that this is a good flood information, but then I, then I wanted to check at, at the beginning when we only had this period here, 1446 to 1545, so only nine years of the of the accounting books. I wanted to check whether this is a, a good indicator of a flood or not, and then I, I somehow um, um, compared it to the instrumental period, so the seasonality of this, not the, the monthly distribution of these flood events. And this is very similar, it's very similar, um, especially if you look at the seasonal um, distribution. So um, the correlation um, between the monthly distribution of flood events here in the instrumental period and in the 50-year period from 1600 to 6050 is uh, 0.813, but we do not have this peak here. But this is exactly what we are looking for. We want to see differences of small flood events over time. Um, yeah. So, last slide. Thank you. 
last slide uh, will be an outlook to the future. So let's assume we would have these city accounts in Switzerland exist for almost every city. So it's, it's a, a lot of work to do, but probably it would be worth to, to do it. Um, if, let's assume we would have all this information from these city accounts. We could then um, detect uh, the contribution or the non-contribution of, of, of singular flood events of, of, of river systems. So for instance, this is a hypothetical case here. If all these sites here would report um, that they spend money for, for, for river protection, for bridge protection, but these here in eastern Switzerland didn't, so we would know, okay, river Sane, river M, river um, R, and so on, they, the flood was coming from those river systems, so it's, it's, it's situated here. So, but if this is the future, this would be a lot of work to do, but with this I would like to end this presentation and thank you for your attention. Can you go back to your correlation slide, please? Okay, how many observations do you have for that correlation? How many historical observations? Yes. 70. 17? Or 70. 70. Ah, 70. 70. Okay. Okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Have you uh, noted any change on the type of flooding? I mean, if, because you are comparing the two periods, one is covering part of the Little Ice Age yeah. and the more recent period. Have you notice any change in terms of which kind of mechanism, if there has been any change on the mechanism, like rain over snow or snow melt that uh, is producing flooding on some of these periods? Uh, so far it didn't look at, at the causes of flood events, but this is certainly a point we are going to do. Um, and in the accounting books, we don't find any, any reasons for flood events. We only see the costs that, pr that were produced by a flood event. But if you have a look at uh, chronicle reports there, in some cases, at uh, very big events, it is possible to do. Um, so far, I did not do the, this analysis. I was focused on the reconstruction of, of the discharges and the water levels. But this will be the next step, certainly. <laughs>